so I can adjust it depending on how the time's going. Sure. So we'll be in good shape. Ari's, uh, Ari's parents got to come and see this presentation when I did it at the U one time. And uh, so I thought since she worked right here, yes, awesome. if she could make it, that'd be fun. Hello. Can we sing a song? Could you? John, you just tell me when you're ready and we'll start. Yeah. Right there. There you go. Thanks. Because if we don't, then I'll just hmm? keep visiting until we right. Nope. Whenever, whenever you're ready to go. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, as soon as everybody takes their seats, we'll get started. Tom, as soon as everybody takes their seats, we'll get started. <laughs> um, I'm using the floor mic because every time I get off that stage, I knock down his props. So I'm down here instead. Um, welcome to Legalize It, Feeding Livestock Food Waste. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to remind everybody of the cooking competition this evening in the Iowa Ballroom. It's from 6 to 7. Um, our speaker for this topic is John Polanski, and he is a retired food processing specialist from the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program. He researched, wrote, testified, and lobbied for a bill that changed Minnesota state law regarding the feeding of food byproducts to livestock to more closely parallel to the federal law, the Swine Health Protection Act. So let's give John a nice round of applause. Well, it's certainly nice to hear the applause before the presentation <laughs> because you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, prior to my retirement a few years ago, I spent the previous 23 years at the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program as a food processing specialist where I helped the food processing industry with both waste management and waste reduction of their waste streams. Uh, examples of waste management would be reusing the food byproducts as animal feed, composting, or land application. Examples of waste reduction would be reduce, helping them reduce water use, byproduct losses, uh, wastewater loading, and energy use. MinTEP was originally funded in 1984 to work with smaller companies on hazardous waste streams because those felt those are the companies who couldn't afford the consultants. But in the intervening years, they started getting more and more calls from uh, companies, the food processing industry, asking for help. And so what they did is they did a survey of 800 plus food processors in Minnesota asking them what sort of issues they were facing. And the results of that survey showed that they were concerned about rising landfill costs and rising wastewater treatment costs. And it was at that point they decided to bring somebody on to help with this issue. What I'm going to talk to you about this morning is how and why I went about researching, writing, testifying, and lobbying for a bill that made our state law for the feeding of food byproducts to livestock more closely parallel to the federal guidelines. Now, um, I would rather not have you take a lot of notes during the presentation for simple reason it's going to be available online as the video will be. I'd rather have you listen as we go along and ask questions as we go along. The one note you might want to take is the note about the journal where this paper is available. It's a, the Journal of Applied Engineering in Agriculture, January 1995 issue, volume 11, number one, pages 115 to 119. 
Any reference librarian can find that paper for you. I'll give you just a minute to jot that down. I always found that when I was in classes, if I was spending most of my time taking notes, I really wasn't hearing what the lecture was talking about. So that's the one note I'd like you to take, and then for the rest of the day, you can take notes. But I'm just saying you really don't have to, especially as we get into some of the legal terminology, because it gets rather complicated. Okay? Anybody need a few more seconds to copy, to copy that down? Everybody, can everybody hear me okay? We're good? Okay. Well, um, you see, because, when I interviewed for the position, they asked me, what can the food processors do with their waste streams instead of sending them to the landfill? And because my undergraduate degree was in animal science, I said, well, we can certainly feed it back, some of it back to livestock and create more food. And the reason that we can do that Had to add a little humor. The, re the reason we can do that is the livestock can make use of those nutrients, particularly the pigs. Um, out of all the animals in the animal kingdom, the one that's closest to us in our digestive system is the pig. You know, you might think we'd be like the graceful swan or the cheetah or the quarter racing horse, any other graceful animal, but we're closest to the pig, which means if you can eat a suit and certain food material, the pigs can eat it. So they make an excellent recycler for the byproducts going back to. And as I started on this, I, I was brought on uh, to look at this. And by the way, the model that I'm going to talk to you about today is a model for 20 other states in our country today that can use the same model to update and bring their state laws on the feeding of food byproducts to livestock and bring their state laws up into the 21st century. Well, as I started on this project, I was out talking to some of the farmers, I was out talking to some of the food processors, and I got really excited about this. I thought, this is going to be a breeze. All I have to do is line up food processors with farmers, and we'll start recycling this material, and away we go. Um, I get back on the campus, and I'm talking to a Dr. Chuck Clanton in Biosystems and Ag Engineering, and he said to me, John, I think there's some laws regulating this. I think maybe you want to, before you get too excited about this, why don't you go check out the laws and see what they actually allow you to do. So in a conversation I had with Dr. Michael Pollan, who was an extension veterinarian at the time at the University of Minnesota, he suggested to me that I talk to Dr. Ernest Zirkel, who was a state veterinarian in New Jersey, to get a better understanding of both the federal law and the state laws and how they interact. Because there were, as you can see, both federal and state laws governing this issue. Uh, he thought Dr. Zirkel would be an excellent resource because they had 40 farms at that time. This is in the early 90s. They had 40 farms at that time that they were feeding food waste back to livestock. In addition, at that time, they were going into Philadelphia, picking up residential organic waste, and bringing it out back to New Jersey and feeding it to the hogs. So large-scale operations there. And uh, Dr. Uh, Zirkel was an excellent resource. The federal law is referred to as the Swine Health Protection Act. Now notice, the federal law is specific on the class of livestock it's talking about, specific to swine. The state laws are referred to as the garbage feeding laws, which makes it very easy to find them in the state statutes, because all you have to do is go to the index of any state statute, look up garbage feeding, and it'll point you to a section where the, the laws are. Well, how did these laws come to be? Remember, 100 years ago, the main mode of transportation in the country was trains. And what the trains would do, and I'm going to use a hypothetical example here, a train was coming out of California heading east to Iowa, and then on to New York. They didn't put all the groceries on the train when it left California. As they started doing meal prep on the trains, they didn't hold the garbage until they got to their final destination. It was dropped off at various train stations along the routes. In fact, some of the train stations were getting so much garbage or from meal preparation 
that they had their own piggeries right there at the train station. That's how much was being uh, uh, discharged or sent off from the trains after, after meal preparation because of all the trains that were used for tr travel at that time. Well, in 1932, there was an outbreak in California of vesicular xanthema, uh, and, which is a viral disease. And over the intervening years, uh, it wasn't overnight, but over the intervening years, that disease was spread to 42 states. The term uh, vesicular xanthema, in case you're interested, just refers to the vesicular, refers to pustules that would be either on the feet or the snouts, the mouths of the, the pigs. And the xanthema means that they're being torn open. And of course, once they're torn open, the virus is spread to other livestock. Now, it's important to understand that these diseases aren't spread from, most of them aren't spread from uh, animals to humans, they're spread from animal to animal. If another hog eats pork that was in the garbage and that animal was contaminated with sickle xanthema, hog cholera, African swine fe fever, that disease would then be tra transmitted to the animal that ate it. And that's how the disease was being spread to these various countries, or various states, I should say. By the 1950s, all states had established some sort of garbage feeding law. Some states just flat out allowed it, outlawed it. You, could, you couldn't, simply couldn't do it. They, were, they wanted to stop the spread of any of these diseases. And then in 1980, the Swine Health Protection Act was passed. Now notice, there's a 30 year difference between the state laws when they were passed and when the federal law was passed. It's important to understand that when a federal and a state law both cover the same issue or topic, the federal law always takes precedent, which means the state laws have to at least meet the minimum requirements of the federal law. But it also means the state laws can be more restrictive. And that's exactly what I started to find, both in conversations with Dr. Zirkel and as I started looking at some of the state statutes, including the one from Minnesota. Okay. So what are we really talking about here? What is, what is garbage? And notice we're only looking at the legal definition of one word. Imagine what Congress or your state legislators are dealing with when they're looking at entire sentences, sentences or paragraphs and trying to interpret it. We're only talking about the definition of one word here. The federal law is very specific. It's from the meat of any animal because of the concern for spreading these viral diseases or any material that's been associated with that meat. Very, very specific, okay? But what does that mean if it's, if it's defined as garbage? It means they can't be fed to swine unless it's first treated. And what does that mean? It means that that material has to be boiled for 30 minutes before it can be fed to swine. What the researchers discovered is that by boiling that material for 30 minutes, you basically eliminate or kill any of the viruses or bacteria that are causing any of the diseases. Okay, and that's the federal statute, and that stays in place for any state that's interested in doing this sort of thing. Okay, but notice the federal law also lists various exempted materials, and there's a whole host of them here. And some of them, I've got examples of up here, up here on the uh, the table. Uh, rendered products, because in the rendering of, of uh, animal waste, the blood meal, the bone meal are at a sufficient temperature to kill any of these, these microorganisms. We've got candy, eggs, domestic dairy products, fish from the Atlantic Ocean, uh, or inland waters of the U.S. that do not flow into the Pacific Ocean. So there's a whole category of exempted materials under the federal statute. And that means those materials can be fed directly to livestock. Okay. I found something a little different when I looked at the Minnesota statute. 
Notice it says all waste material. Fruit or vegetable, liquid or solid. Far more restrictive. Okay? But Minnesota also had an exempted paragraph for the vegetable processors and manufacturers for canning of of uh, vegetables and freezing of vegetables. Because those products, the corn, the peas, that sort of thing, a lot of times would be fed to livestock anyway. So those were exempted back in the 1950s. But you can see, we've got a um, real difference between the state statute and the federal law. And what I was hired to do was to look at, and what I told them we could do, was we could feed these byproducts back to livestock. Suddenly, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I've kind of got a choice to make here. And I, this is, uh, was my research assistant position. It was a six-month appointment. It was also going to pay for my master's degree. So I had a couple choices. I could go back to, to MINTAP uh, staff and say, well, my research shows that we really can't do. Our state law doesn't allow us to do what you hired me to do, which would have been an honest statement. And it also would have ended my position at MINTAP. They would have said, thank you very much, and see you later. The other option was to look at, is it possible to get our state law to more closely parallel the federal guidelines? Can that even, can that even be done? And in a conversation, uh, I should point out, uh, um, when I started at MINTAP, the stat, there was only a staff of six people. That'll become an interesting fact here in a minute, but there were only six people at the time that I was brought on as a graduate student. In a conversation I had with Dr. Zirkel, he realized this also, that there was a difference between the New Jersey state law and the federal law for the feeding of these byproducts. So what he did, because he had a cabinet level position, he simply changed their state law. He did not have to go to their legislature because of his position in the state. He said, what we're going to do is that we're going to adopt the federal guidelines, which are far more lenient. And I'm thinking, well, that's certainly one option. So I called one of the professors in a law school at the University of Minnesota who works in this area. And I said to him, I explained to him the situation. I said, I explained to him what New Jersey was doing. And I said, do I have to take this to the legislature? And I'll never forget all these years later his response, you bet you do. And I'm going, darn, <laughs> that, takes, that takes out the easy answer on that one. Um, and any time you're looking at an issue like this, and like I said, this is a model for 20 other states, any of the other states are looking at this, you're going to have to go to whoever enforces your state law. In Minnesota, in a lot of these states, it's a state veterinarian. And you're going to have to get their support. Because remember, Congress and the state legislatures don't enforce the laws they enact them. But before they're going to vote on any change in a state law, they're going to want to know what the enforcing agency's position is on it. Because they're not going to pass something that the enforcing agency isn't, isn't for or they can't possibly handle. So I had to go talk to um, our state veterinarian, who at the time uh, was Dr. Thomas Haggerty. An interesting kind of, yes. Exactly. Good, very good question. The Board of Animal Health and the state veterinarians are the enforcing agency. Very good question. Exactly. They're going to go out and inspect these farms and make sure things are being done you know, the way that they're supposed to. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll give you a, an interesting example here in, in a minute uh, about how that works. But um, when I was talking to uh, Dr. Haggerty, he said to me, What's the big deal here? Why don't we just throw the stuff in the landfill? What's the problem? My food breaks down if it sits out on the counter too long. Even if it's in the refrigerator, it'll break down after a while if it's, if it's in the refrigerator too long. In fact, if I've got meat or something else that's not sufficiently packaged in my freezer, it'll get freezer burned and I'll have to throw that out too. So since the stuff automatically breaks down, why do we need to change this? Why do we need to uh, not be putting it in the landfill? Fortunately, I had read an article by a Dr. William Rathje out of Arizona who had done core samples of landfills. And he actually wrote a book on this and he has an article in a National Geographic about this. He had done core samples in landfills, going down to see 
what was happening in the landfills, and what kind of materials he was finding. He could, a lot of times, he could identify the year because the newspapers he was pulling up in these core samples hadn't broken down. Likewise, he was getting corn uh, steaks with the fat still on them, uh, baked goods, a lot of food materials that were 15 plus years old that hadn't broken down at all. Because the material is packed in too tight. There isn't a sufficient oxygen, there isn't sufficient moisture for it to break down. So when I was able to point that out to Dr. Haggerty, he said, oh, I see. Um, okay, well, I see what you're trying to do. And by, if we can keep this food material out of the landfill, not only will we save landfill space, we'll also be able to reuse that, make better use of that food uh, by feeding it back to livestock. So um, at that point, he gave, us, he gave us support. But he said, uh, this, is my, this was in uh, November of 1990. Legislative session starts in January. He said, but we've got a problem, and this relates to your question back there. Um, we've only got three animal health inspectors, the Board of Animal Health, to inspect these farms. If we open this up and have more farms that are feeding these food byproducts, how are we going to, how are we going to, how are we going to provide the surveillance to this? We don't have sufficient staff. So I went home and, and thought about that for a while. And you know, they tell you when you've got a difficult problem, if you've got a difficult decision to make, to sleep on it. Because one of the things that happens is your body goes to sleep, but your mind keeps processing information. And I'll never forget, I think it was in February of 91, several months later, I was shaving one morning. And I'll never forget, I'm bringing the razor right up here. And I wasn't, in my mind, I wasn't even thinking about it. But the thought came to me, wait a minute. Why can't we have the licensed veterinarians that are in the state already provide the surveillance for this program? They're more than qualified to do it. The food processor would gladly pay the, the veterinarian to inspect the farms because they're getting reduced disposal costs. The farmer would gladly have the veterinarian come on their farm because they're getting a free or no cost feed source. And by the way, the highest cost in raising livestock is the feed. So the farmer would be behind it, the veterinarian would be behind it because they're qualified to do it, and they're getting paid. In addition, this surveillance system wouldn't cost the state a dime. It would be all self-supporting. So I took this idea back to um, Dr. Haggerty, and he said, oh, that'll, that would work. We can, we can work with that sort of system. Now remember, we're into February of 91 now. The, the uh, um, legislative session has already started. And he said, but we don't have anybody to work on this. If we're going to do this, we don't have sufficient staff to work on this. So I thought, why don't I do it? I mean, I've researched the federal law. I've researched at least the Minnesota law. I know what we're trying to do. Why don't I put this together? Now, as I started to think about this, I thought, and I know one of the questions that's going on in your head is, how did I get this far as a, as a graduate student? And I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, I could have done what Dr. Zirkel did and basically written it saying that we're adopting the federal guidelines. But imagine, there's two problems with this. Imagine going to the legislature and explaining to them that we're going to take a law that's been in place since the 1950s and we're going to remove it and put in a whole new law. That was one difficulty with that. The other one was, remember, we already had the vegetable processors exempt. And they've been exempt since the 1950s. I didn't want to go to them 40 years after the fact and, guess, and say, guess what? You're going to fall under a new set of laws. So I wanted to leave them alone. And then a conversation I had with uh, Dr. Jerry Houghton, animal science professor at the U. He said, well, John, why don't you um, go out and see what some of the other states are doing? And that took me over to the law library where I started looking through the indexes of the state statutes to see what some of the other states were doing. I believe um, I researched 18 states total. I'm just going to give, including Minnesota, I'm just going to give you uh, an example of a few of them here.
What's Wisconsin doing? Remember I said the state statutes could be more restrictive than the federal guidelines? Wisconsin flat out outlawed it. You cannot feed garbage, okay? How do they define it? Very similar to the way Minnesota defined it, okay? On to Georgia. Georgia doesn't allow garbage feeding. How do they define it? Very similar to the Minnesota statute. Okay? But at least in Minnesota, you can boil it for 30 minutes. In these states, Wisconsin, Georgia, you can't even do that. It's been outlawed, okay? I get to Nebraska. Feeding garbage in Nebraska isn't allowed. I'm getting a little frustrated. I'm going, we're not getting real far here. How does, how does Nebraska define it? It's even more restrictive. They include poultry, but it's also fruits and vegetables. I look a little farther in the Nebraska statute and look what I found. I found this paragraph in a state that does not allow garbage feeding. It says, when deemed to be in the best interest of the livestock industry, the department, meaning the Board of Animal Health, may exempt specified materials of a non-meat nature. That's the paragraph I needed to insert into our statute to make our state law more closely parallel to federal guidelines. And this is the same paragraph that the 20 other states, including Iowa, can insert in their state statute. They would update and bring their state laws up into the 21st century and allow the feeding of a whole host of non-meat food byproducts directly to livestock. I'll give you a minute to jot that down. By the way, the, the food processors that I was working with are the people that make the groceries that you buy in the store. Like I said, I've got some examples of it here. And actually, their percentage of losses are very low across all sectors, whether it's meat processing, cereals, grains, doesn't matter. Their percentage of losses are actually very low. It's just that the volume of food they produce on any given day, a product they produce on any given day is so large that the actual quantities of waste can be relatively large on a daily basis. They're not, they're not inefficient. They wouldn't be in business if they were uh, that inefficient. So now I had, now I knew what we wanted to do. And I went over and contacted the legislative assistant we have at the University of Minnesota. It was Dick Hemmingson at the time. Uh, larger organizations, in fact, a lot of industry, have somebody that works between their company or their institution and the legislature. And I took it over to Dick Hemmingson, and he said, he looked at it and he says, well, this is both economically and environmentally sound. I think I can find you sponsors for this. And um, remember when I, I pointed out the slide that said, that said, I think I'll just take a shot at this and see what I can do? I had talked to Dick Hemmingson at that time, and he had said to me, John, if it's going to go into committee this session, it has to go to committee before it ever gets to the floor, you've got about two weeks to, do, to come up with something. Uh, he found uh, the, the Senate sponsor was a gentleman by the name of Tracy Beckman. The House sponsor was uh, Jim Girard. And, and uh, Dick told me, he said, since you wrote it, they're probably going to ask you to come in and testify for it. So it was off to the legislature. Now, you may be wondering, okay, how does this kid young man, older man, <laughs> I went back as an older adult to get my, mas my masters, get this far, where I'm actually going over to the Capitol and going to start testifying before committees on a bill that I wrote. Remember when I told you when I started at Mintap there were only six people? Well, about the first of that year of 91, my immediate supervisor, the person who had hired me, left on an extended leave for personal reasons. She's out of the office. Shortly after that, our director goes on maternity leave. 
she's out of the office. We've got a few engineers and a chemist. I was unsupervised. <laughs> and I thought to myself, rather than going back and telling them our state law doesn't allow this, I'm going to go as far and as fast as I can forward with this until somebody tells me I don't know what I'm doing and go home. And they never did. It was a, a fascinating experience, a very lengthy experience. I'll give you a couple of uh, quick examples of some of the things that happened. Uh, Dick Hemmingson, when people are going to go testify before a committee, he's got a tip sheet of how you do this, of the protocol of how you do this. Well, unfortunately, when I got called by Jim Girard to come testify before the House Subcommittee on Agriculture, Dick was in Washington, D.C., lobbying for some other issues. So I end up at the subcommittee at a table like, in front of a table, kind of like this, only about twice as long, with a state representative sitting there, and the chairperson was in the middle. And I just listened to what other people were doing, and I noticed the way they addressed the committee was, it was always, if, if they presented their material, but if one of the representatives asked a question, it was always, Mr. Chairman, Representative so-and-so, and then they'd answer the question. So I go, I guess that's how, that's the protocol for this. So when I got called out to ask, you know, to present what my issue was, I, I did that. And I remember one of the representatives, uh, Representative Steve Dill, uh, who was a, uh, not only a representative, he was also a veterinarian. Um, he uh, called on me and he said, why do we need to inspect these farms every month, like we have to the garbage feeding farms, when we only inspect restaurants once a year? Well, um, again, I'm kind of stuck. And the best answer I could give him, because his explanation made all the sense in the world to me, but the best explanation I could give him was, that's what Dr. Haggerty wants. He wants to make sure that these farms are inspected on a monthly basis. And it was Mr. Mr. Chairman, Representative Dill, and I gave him, gave him the answer. And we moved forward from there. Interestingly enough, uh, Steve, because he was a veterinarian, without me knowing, and he told me about this later, went and talked to Dr. Haggerty and said, come on. Do we really have to inspect these farms once a month? Why can't we do them once a year? And he got, he got Dr. Haggerty to agree that, in fact, they would just inspect them once a year. But that was because he was an equal with Dr. Haggerty in, in professional careers. I couldn't have done that. It would not uh, never been able to do that. So that's one of the things that happened. Uh, the other thing that happened was when a bill is in the House and in the Senate, both chambers will pass uh, a bill. And a lot of times, one house or the other will adopt the first one. That's exactly what happened. The Senate passed the first version unanimously. The House adopted that one, passed it, but they added six amendments to it. And we're getting late in the session this, uh, um, that year in 91. And um, I'm talking to Senator Beckman and um, I'm, at, I'm at one of the meetings uh, when they're looking at these various amendments. I'll never forget this. I'm sitting at a long table. Senator Beckman's at my immediate right. We've got at least three representatives on the sides of the table, maybe one of them, four, might have been four with one at the end of the table. One of the amendments comes up. After explaining what I was trying to accomplish, one of the amendments comes up. Senator Beckman says, is there anybody here to explain to us what this is about? Because they'll vote for something, but they don't want to be seen as fools because they didn't know what they were voting for. So he simply asked for an explanation of what this one particular amendment was. I still don't know why I did this. But I was, I was frustrated. I just leaned over to Senator Beckman, and in a soft voice I said, we can pull it, meaning we can remove that amendment from the bill. He looked up and said, pull it. And I go, damn, <laughs> that's where the power is. You have to show up. I have no idea what that amendment was. But in my self-interest, I wanted my bill to move forward. That went back. Um, and the, with that one removed, the House agreed with that. It went back for a final vote at the Senate. It's five to midnight on the last day of the, of the Senate, of the legislature. Tracy Beckman came out of the chamber at five to midnight and said to me, 
We've got it passed. I don't know if we have time to get it back to the House. But fortunately, we, were in a bi we have a biennium legislature in Minnesota. We have a two-year legislature. And we were in the first year of the two-year session, which means if it had to come up the second year, we didn't have to start all over. It, they would come back on the floor as it was at the end of the first session. So it's 5 to midnight. Senate got to pass. They didn't have time to get it back to the House. I hung around uh, afterwards. They had a little cheese and wine thing at the Capitol at, after midnight to, for all the representatives and anybody who was the lobbyists and anybody who was involved in the session just to celebrate the, the end of the session. And I saw Representative Gerard coming walking down the hall to this little get together. I was the last person he was expecting to see. I could just tell by his facial expression. He did not expect that I would still be there. And I could also tell by his facial expression he thought I was just going to unload on him. Because remember, this is my job, and it didn't get completed. But I knew he had done everything he possibly could. We just ran out of time. So I walked up to him and I said, Jim, we're very, very close on this. Thanks for all you've done. I really appreciate all your hard work. We'll get this next time. And sure enough, when we came back the next year, I was down there at the Capitol. The director asked me, she said, do you really have to be down there for this. And I said to her, I just want to see the green lights come on when they take the final vote. So it's down to the, down to the Capitol. But Jim actually came up into the gallery to find me to let me know that it had passed. So it was a long process, but it was uh, just a step by step and keeping at it that we got that, we got that passed and got that changed. And it was a fascinating experience. Uh, having um, no previous experience in that, uh, not a lawyer, I wasn't even a political science major in college, no legislative experience. Uh, it was just a fascinating learning experience. And by the way, when our director came back from maternity leave, I was able to, it, the bill hadn't passed yet, but I was able to come into her office with a copy of the bill and say, here's what I've got, here's what's going on. And that's what helped to make my position as a research assistant, a graduate six month appointment, turn into a 23 year career. So what do we end up with here? Under the new Minnesota law, the non-meat food waste can now be fed directly to livestock without having to be treated. Far easier, far more efficient. The boiling of it is a labor-intensive process, and it takes a lot of time and energy. It's, it, and the farms that are doing it are doing it very successfully, but it takes a lot of time and energy. Plus, the farms are generally located a large uh, along large metropolitan areas because the, the volume of food that they need in order to make it, that work for them. We have food processors scattered throughout Minnesota that are in smaller towns and it would be ideal if their waste material, their byproducts would be fed directly to a farmer. And that's what changing the state statute did. It's very similar to the federal guidelines. Remember the federal definition? Very specific from the meat of any animal. Federal exempted material. Any questions on why the federal government exempted some of these materials? I'm noticing that there's um, not vegetables or fruit in the exemptions of the federal. Um, is that somewhere else? No. Okay. There were that very good question. Very good question on the on the federal definition. What was the question? There's not fruit and vegetables are not included in the federal guidelines as an exempted waste. But they're also not included in the federal definition of garbage. So they're kind of in a gray. They're just out there. They're just, yeah, they're just out okay. there. They don't, they don't have to, under the federal guidelines, they don't have to specifically be exempted. Very good question. And then, do you have any idea, um, this, uh, you passed this, this legislation was passed in 92 mm -hmm. in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea or is there any data available on um, the diversion of food waste to livestock since that time? Yes, there is, and I'm, I'm getting to that. Okay. I'll we'll get to that for you, but that's another very good question. It doesn't do much good if we got a state law passed and nothing's really happening. 
or we don't have any documented results or any data to show what we've been able to accomplish. What kind of model would this be for other states if I stand up here and say, well, we don't have a clue of how much is being diverted or, or whether the program's been successful or not. So that's a very good, very good question, okay? But the reason, remember, when I talked about earlier, the federal law is very, very specific related to the meat of any animal in their definition or anything that's in, come in contact with it, which means if it's a restaurant and it's a hamburger, the bread, the tomato, uh, uh, the lettuce, everything else that was associated with that, when that's in the bin, that all counts as garbage under the federal definition, okay? But it's very specific that it's just the meat or anything that's been associated with it. Question? Yes. So in that situation, would it be possible for a restaurant to uh, separate out food prep waste that was non-meat? Very good question. Very good question. And that came up actually with the Board of Animal Health in Minnesota. The question was related, the question was related to grocery stores. Since we got the state law changed, why can't, if we're only collecting the produce from a grocery store, or like you said, separating it out in a restaurant, the, the vegetables and everything else from the meat, why can't that go out directly to a farm? And the Board of Animal Health, and I think very wisely, said no, because, because there is a meat counter in the grocery store, somebody could inadvertently put meat in with those vegetables and that produce. Not intentionally, but they're thinking, wait a minute, we've got outdated meat here that I normally saw thrown in the dumpster. Over in produce, they're recycling this to livestock. Why don't I do that too? So they go over there and dump it in and suddenly that's contaminated. Likewise in a restaurant, even if they were separating it out, there's the risk of it being contaminated. Very good questions. So, and the states are gonna be different on that. In Minnesota, the board said no, if it's a grocery store, a school, a cafeteria, anything like that, a restaurant, that all counts as garbage and has to go to a farm where they're actually boiling it for 30 minutes because there's too high of a risk of it becoming common, contaminated with meat. These are some of the issues that we had to, had to address as we were working through the process. Again, yes? Why is the fish from the Atlantic Ocean treated differently in the Pacific? <laughs> I've never got given this presentation and not had that question asked, and I thought this was going to be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> There's the sea lions in the Pacific have a disease called the San Miguel sea lion virus. And that is fatal to pigs. So because of that disease concern, they've outlawed the feeding of any of the fish from the Pacific Ocean. Thanks for asking that. When I did this presentation at the U, the faculty member would sit there at the side of the class and he'd always smile when somebody asked that question because he knew everybody was reading through the materials as I was, as I was going along. But that's why. They, were, they didn't want to bring any other diseases in. By the way, you can see we've got a federal law regarding this, and it's because of disease control, or pre you know, preventing the spread of disease. We've got state laws regarding this. If an international flight comes into Minneapolis, with food on board. By law, that food material could be taken out to the farms and boiled for 30 minutes and fed. The state doesn't even want to touch that because of the risk of foreign diseases that are in some of these other countries that we've been able to get rid of in the United States. So any food that comes in on an international flight to Minneapolis, it's either uh, sterilized and landfilled or it's burned. But it does not leave to go to any of the, the operations that feed that material. Even though, by federal law, it could, it could be. Okay. Okay, so here's our new Minnesota statute. Remember the definition where it's all waste material? We left the processes of frozen and canned vegetables alone. And here's the Nebraska paragraph. Which lets the Board of Animal Health on a case-by-case -case basis decide if that product can be fed directly. 
which means they, weren't, they didn't want to turn the whole thing loose, nor, nor did I. They wanted still to be able to monitor it. Remember, Dr. Haggerty says, how are we going to provide the surveillance to these additional farms? We still, so those farms are still permitted, and the trucks that transport it are permitted because they didn't want material dropping off the trucks, creating hazards of odor problems, rodent problems, things like that. They wanted to make sure that it was being done in a safe and sanitary manner. So any of the new farms under the new statute are still permitted. Then the Board of Animal Health had to rewrite uh, the rules. The bill was passed at the end of the, or during the 92 session and signed a law by the governor. But since the Board of Animal Health is the enforcing agency, they had to rewrite their rules. That took about another year. We're into about 93 now before they get that done. In fact, they called me on the phone and they said, John, um, we know it's legal and everything's set up, but we really don't have the rules in place yet. Can you kind of keep this quiet till we can get our rules changed? And, you know, you're trying to work in a cooperative manner with the folks. So I said, absolutely. I had one of our communications people come to me when he heard that I had gotten a bill through the legislature, and he wanted to put that in our newsletter. And I was adamant. I refused to give him that information. I said, you're going to have to wait until the Board of Animal Health says that they're ready for this. Because it's just out of respect for the efforts they'd made and, and, and backing what I was trying to do. Okay, so now we're into 93, the rules get passed. 94, um, I had um, completed my master's degree. My ma master's thesis is actually on this whole issue of the difference between the state law and the federal law. And what I had done as an appendum to that is I had come up with an eight-step sample problem. And this is going to be attached uh, to the presentation so you'll have access to this so that the food processor, the farmer, the veterinarian, the extension ex educator, and the nutritionist can all get together at, at one time, run through these eight steps to make sure that this is going to work out for everybody in included. Okay? Because what you don't want to do is start it with somebody, have a, farmer, have a food processor say to a farmer, hey, you can have this stuff, just come and get it. And six months later, the farmer comes back and says, I don't understand why I'm losing money on this, but because um, you're giving it to me for free, but I am, so I'm stopping the process. So to avoid that sort of thing, I came up with these eight steps that they could follow to go through to make sure that they could numerically show that it was going to be economically viable for the farmer and for the food processor. The example I just gave you of the farmer coming back after six months, maybe it's the logistics, maybe it's the transportation costs that are killing them. And even though he's getting the, the food waste for free, and, and like I said, the largest expense in raising livestock is, is the feed. So they're getting a really low cost feed source here. But maybe it's the logistics that's, that's killing this project. Well, if they addressed it ahead of time, like these eight steps would do, they would have, said, they would have realized that, and then the food processor probably would have said, look, we'll deliver it to you because we're still reducing our landfilling costs. And that's why I put these eight steps together. And this is, this is part of that model that uh, other states can use. So what does this give us? We now have a complete loop where food's produced on the farm. You can think of the horn of plenty here as also being the food processor, which means byproducts from that food processor can go directly across to the hog comes back around the loop and we're creating more food. We're using the food waste for its intended purpose. That's why on the EPA hierarchy, <coughs> the first item is reducing food waste, the second item is getting back for human consumption if you possibly can, and the third one is using it for animal feed. Okay? And around we go. So going to your question, How much is being fed? Well, back in 95, which was the first numbers that we had, uh, there was a um, Governor's Select Committee on Recycling and the Environment, score reports. They came out every year documenting this from all the counties. And back in 95, we, from data from that, we showed there was about 35,000 tons that was being fed. 
But at that time, they weren't breaking out anything going to composting. It was just organic recycling. And it wasn't until 2006 that it actually came, the feeding of the organics came into a separate category where we had absolute data on it. And what I've shown you here is some of the years. Now what I want you to notice is the vacillation in the numbers. They go up and down. But also notice that for the highest years in 2006, 2011, and 2015, that curve is going up for the higher numbers. Likewise, when it drops down, the lower numbers, starting in 2008, going on to 2000, 2011, I'm sorry, it's, uh, 2008, yeah, 2011 and uh, 2012, and 2016, where, th where the numbers are lower, that curve is also going up over time. So even though the numbers are vacillating between a high and a low, both curves are increasing over time. And we know that that material is being directly fed, fed to livestock. Here are the 20 other states that can use this model, insert that paragraph into the state statute, to bring their state law up to date and into the 21st century. I was talking with somebody from Colorado at um, breakfast this morning. Uh, I said I didn't remember if Colorado was one of the states. You can see that they are. Iowa is one of the states. Notice that Wisconsin, Iowa, North and South Dakota, all around Minnesota outlaw the feeding of these food byproducts to livestock. But this is a model, and that's why Jenny Trent called me and asked me to come and present. She said, and it was interesting, this is an interesting phone call. Uh, I've been retired for five years. She called me and she says, I think it's time to revisit your work. And I hung up the phone and I thought to myself, revisit it? I did that yesterday. <laughs> and then I looked at it and I said, oh, that was 26 years ago. <laughs> That's how fast the time goes. But yes, it's a model that we did in Minnesota that all of these 20 states can actually do themselves. Yes. So we, we've got about five minutes left, so we'll just open it up for questions. Is that okay, John? That's fine. Thank you. So what is it about these 20 states that make them more amenable to using this exemption and not the other 30 or 20? The, the other ones have something in their statute that allows it. Okay. These, and I got this data off of the Harvard, Harvard Law School has a food law and policy clinic and they put together a data sheet on all of the states and their laws. And these are the 20 that for some reason, they either outlaw the feeding of it altogether, or they've got restrictions that don't allow the non-meat food waste to be fed separately. Okay. There's something... These are the most restrictive states. That right. Got it. Right, exactly. But these are, remember, these, this is 40% of our country. We've got one way in the back. Sure. Helping me get my steps in today, Aubrey. Do you know if this has any impact on any farmers just with um, when they're selling, you know, we've seen a lot more organic grass fed, you know, those kinds of labels. Does this right. have any impact on those labels? Very good question. Um, the, the garbage, particularly the garbage fed hogs um, are getting a premium at the stockyards. And the farmers that are garbage feeding, what, they don't have breeding operations. They buy what are called feeder pigs, 50 pound pigs. They bring them onto their farm. And from the time those farms are brought on the farm, that's all they get is the restaurant, the, the garbage material that they're, that they're eating until they get up to market weight, 230, 240 pounds, and they go to market. But those, those hogs over the years have been getting a premium at the, at the stockyards. Yes? So something that we're running to into a, a college campus is listeria and mm -hmm. so how does a one inspection a year with a, a veterinarian help Be because that? it's not non-meat food material so that would go to a farm that was boiling it for 30 minutes yeah no they weren't boiling it so, right yeah right and they, so they probably shouldn't have been is, and it's got meat in it we were separating it, but well, yeah, yeah, it's a fine line. It, but uh -huh. it had come in contact with yes. the separated material. Uh -huh. So by state law, 
it's actually you can't do that. Yeah. Okay. That's now that's an interesting question, out. though, because remember when I told you I talked to um, extension veterinarian, um, uh, name slips my mind, but he said back in the 50s we'd go out and inspect these farms that were supposedly boiling this material, yeah. and they had a 55 gallon drum that was all rusted out. That, that that's where they were boiling it. He says they couldn't possibly; it wouldn't have held water. But the farmers are standing there adamant. Oh yeah, we're boiling this stuff. Yeah. 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 So, so John, is there some kind of a certification process um, for generators of this material that would eliminate some of those um, instances in any state that you're aware of? Well, the certification is, is the state law and working with the Board of Animal Health to get their state laws up to date. Now, if they don't allow the feeding of garbage, we've been doing it in Minnesota for 26 years, you know, since I was there, but that, that actually goes back far before that, like I said, back into the 50s when they were doing that. Um, we've got a long history of it being done nationally successfully. So if the state law doesn't even allow the feeding of material that does require boiling, that's, that can be changed too. And it's not like you're going out on a, on a limb saying, why don't we just do it, change it to this? Because both the federal law and various state laws allow it. But that's the way to legally do it. And what's, what's happening with like a campus is somebody, and I never reported anybody, that wasn't our job. We weren't a regulatory agency, I never reported anybody. But as the veterinarians and the animal health inspectors and are out there, you know, they're going, so how come your shed's full of baked goods over here? Where did that come from? You know, or how come you've got a couple kettles of soup back here? Where, where did that come from? And that, that's how they would discover some of the places that we're doing and probably shouldn't have been. In fact, um, if the states aren't enforcing their law, uh, the federal government will actually do that for them. And it wasn't in Minnesota, it wasn't until 1986 that the state was granted authority to provide that service. They had to go through a long process uh, to get that certified so they could provide that instead of the federal government. Oh, any other questions? We have about time for one more. Anyone? Anyone? Ah. I'm just, just going to touch quick on the certification related question. So how that works is, John mentioned the exempt and the garbage feeder. There are two types of permits that the farms obtain from the Board of Animal Health. So that's technically how they're exactly. permitted with one of the two permits. Right. But if, if the material, like you mentioned, it was on a college campus and it was being sent to a farm, that then the state doesn't allow the feeding of garbage, so they can't get that permit. And they can't, they shouldn't be feeding that um, directly then. Hope that didn't destroy your program, but it gives you something, it gives, it, it gives, you, it gives you something to work towards. So thank you so much, John. This Welcome. is a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, let's just give John a round of applause. Thank you. Um, and I want to remind you to remember to rate this session on your Summit app that we've all downloaded. And um, lunch is next and the US EPA awards program. So thank you.